Hi guys and welcome back to Stackdose Podcast. Today we're doing another turbo dose and we're going to go through the approach to hypotension which should um, inform your decision making a little bit when you're going into the simulations surrounding hypotension. Hypotension has got quite a broad differential and it can be quite difficult to structure how you assess these patients. So we're just going to go through um, a way in which we do this based on our sort of experience and particularly Matt working in ED seeing these patients very, very frequently. So Matt, we're obviously talking about hypotension and and I'm presuming hopefully that you're going to be saying that your approach starts with a, a primary survey, shock, horror. Well, as, you say, you know, as ever, it's the A2E, isn't it? So you want to go in and uh, although blood pressure is is often highlighted as the issue to you normally from a triage nurse or from a paramedic or, or whoever's told you that the patient is hypotensive, you still need to start at the top. So from an airway perspective, you know, they're, they're normally OK outside of the peri-rest patients. Airway and breathing are normally not a, a problem. Um, but there are some important things to consider as you're going as you're assessing the patient's airway and assessing their breathing. Uh, number one, if you've got an airway problem, is that you know airway swelling from anaphylaxis? So is that is the hypotension due to the, the allergic reaction? In terms of breathing, there's a, a few important things you need to consider. If it's a trauma patient, is this a you know a traumatic injury? So are they bleeding from their chest? Do they have a, a big hemothorax? Is it a tension pneumothorax, for example? If it's more of a medical patient, do you think actually is this is this chest sepsis? Is there a large pneumonia detectable clinically, or is this something like a, a pulmonary edema, a heart failure patient? Yeah, I think so. I think it's about keeping that broad differential open for airway breathing, but that and and treating as you find as you go along. But certainly, we'd want to be getting oxygen on early for these patients if they're critically unwell. Um, listening to their chest and as you say making sure that that, um, you're ruling out some of those diagnoses as you go along and then when we get to circulation we need to think about a stepwise approach to how we actually manage that circulation so there's quite a lot to do within the circulation particularly within a a hypotensive patient so how do you sort of go about that Matt? I think one of the one of the keys is to get them flat early so you need to preserve perfusion to the brain you don't want these patients collapsing um, and then you want to check a heart rate, so you can check that manually, but just by feeling for a, for a pulse. Just be aware that not all beats will be transmitted, certainly things like atrial fibrillation. Just want to know, are they bradycardic, are they tachycardic? Um, consider sticking the ECG, the three lead ECG monitor on. Obviously, you want you know, attach the blood pressure cuff, you want serial monitoring. Make sure that b- blood pressure is cycling and get some access early. Getting a 12 lead ECG is often very important as well. You want to know, are they, certainly in terms of tachycardia, are they tachycardic as a consequence of their hypotension? So is whatever's causing the hypotension uh, making them tachycardic? I, is, it a, is it a physiological tachycardia? Or is the tachycardia the cause of the hypotension? So with heart rates generally above 150, we need to be thinking this isn't a physiological tachycardia. This is probably an SVT or a VT or, or fast air or something like that that's causing the patient to become hypotensive. And then we want to have a quick look at the, the QRS width. So is it a broad or narrow uh, complexes? And quick look at the, the regularity. Is it regular or, or regular? And then we're just going to go down the ALS algorithm there for tachyarrhythmias uh, and give the appropriate treatment as per ALS. Yeah, I think that's really important, Matt. And I think just to add to that, the only other thing that I would say, and this is a discussion that we have with our students quite frequently, is that we need to be, we need to try and get some sort of history on this individual uh, whilst we're contemporaneously, whilst we're doing it, knowing and notifying that the individual has AF um, Mm. previously is really important because actually what looks like a, a sort of arrhythmogenic fast AF could actually be an individual who's got AF and because they've got sepsis, they've got a tachycardia making it look like a fast AF. And what we don't want to be doing is looking at electric or therapeutic ways of reducing that physiological tachycardia in someone that just also happens to have AF, because what you will do is you'll re- reduce their ability to compensate well. So it's just good to get a little bit of a feel for, for what the patient's baseline is. Probably what that patient needs is fluids. Absolutely. Other things to, to check in terms of our assessment. So we need to have a look for any any bleeding, any obvious external bleeding or suspicion of, of internal bleeding. So, you know, is it, is it a trauma patient? Is this a, a post-op surgical patient? Uh, in which case you, you, your suspicion for bleeding is going to be a bit higher. Um, and when you're sort of examining the patient, have a good feel of their peripheries. So I like to feel the patient's hands. I also like to feel the knees. Um, it's it's an, a bit of an ICU thing. A lot of the ICU guys just go and feel the knees. Cold knees are a bad uh, prognostic indicator, uh, but essentially you're, you're getting into the realms of the, the type of shock. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this later. If you've got somebody who's got cool peripheries, 
that generally suggests more of a, a hypovolemic type picture as opposed to someone who's very warm and very flushed, which would suggest a vasodilation normally from a distributive shock such as anaphylaxis brings to mind, a neurogenic shock as well. Finally, when you're at the end of that, if you're happy that the heart rate isn't isn't the cause of the, the hypotension, then you're going to be wanting to give uh, fluids if, if that's appropriate or, or blood products if the, the patient's a, a bleeding patient or a, a, a potential trauma patient. So I think that's a really good way of systematically going through circulation and then once you've attended to all of those elements and then move on to uh, the rest of the primary survey, of course acknowledging that you're going to go back and reassess that patient. So looking at disability, so we've done C, we're going on to D, looking at disability, there's not a lot to, to say about this, this area within this presentation. The patient's already been lay flat and, uh, we, and or we can sort of reassess that as we need to go on. We can consider neurogenic shock uh, in, in this area, so particularly in the context of, of trauma, spinal trauma, if there's neurological issues here, then that can, that can help us um, corroborate a diagnosis. And really d doing temperatures, doing things like that, yes, uh, they, they can be relevant in, in certain situations, trauma and things like that. Um, and to uh, and again, to give you evidence towards uh, a diagnosis such as sepsis, um, but it's not specific to, to the presentation of hypertension and would just come in your normal uh, A to E assessment that you'd be doing with your colleagues. That's it for disability. Really, you're then going to move on to just the last bit. So exposure or sort of examination environment, however you like to, to, to do your E. And, and Matt, what are you looking for in this sort of area? Really, obviously, if it's a trauma patient, you want to make sure there's no sort of hidden you know, sites of bleeding from the extremities. But really, for it, in E, you want to be focusing on the abdomen. Um, certainly in the context of abdominal pain or back pain, you want to make sure that there's not any intra-abdominal sepsis. You want to think about, actually, is, this, uh, is there a leaking aortic aneurysm or, or, or something like that? Um, so just having to make sure there's, there's nothing particularly sinister going on. The surgeons always advocate doing a PR. I personally don't think it's particularly helpful uh, unless there's been a report of a PR bleeding or potentially something like an upper GI bleed. Um, and that's often something that can wait. Um, there's very few interventions that can be done um, from a PR. So I think resuscitate your patient appropriately before, uh, before doing that. Yeah, agreed. That goes on to more of a sort of diagnostic approach yeah. as opposed to treating, assessing and managing your acutely unwell patient. And I think that those sort of investigations can certainly come once the patient is stabilised and once you want to get a, a, a sort of firmer grip on what the diagnosis is if you haven't made one already. So it's a good consideration, but probably for time that's down the line once you've done a few reassessments and, and, and stabilised the patient. So that's it in terms of the, the, the general approach to hypertension. Then we're just going to go through the four different types of shock, categorising those because we feel it, it, it does help to consider these and, and, and therefore consider the diagnosis. That the four different types are uh, distributive or, or otherwise known as um, vasodilatory, hypovolemic, cardiogenic and obstructive. Matt, do you want to talk about distributive? Uh, yeah, so that's essentially, you know, that has been largely re-termed to vasodilatory just because it makes sense. Um, so big causes of that, anaphylaxis that we've already mentioned, so you get massive uh, vasodilation there from the histamine release. Uh, neurogenic, where again you get vasodilation because of the, the nerve supply being interrupted. Um, and things like sepsis, again, where you get vasodilation from that, uh, from the inflammatory response. So those can all, all cause you to be slightly flushed, as we were talking about earlier. Hypervolemic, Joe? Yeah, hypervolemic is the easy one. You're looking at fluid loss. So you're looking at hemorrhage and you're looking at replacing that. So you're looking at whether you actually need to compress a hemorrhage, stop the bleeding um, and, and, and actually uh, replace what has been lost, preferably not with too much uh, crystalloid slash colloid. Uh, cardiogenic, so here we need to consider essentially anything that's causing pump failure. Um, so the obvious one there is, is heart failure where you have poor systolic pump function. Another thing to be considered, so valvular pathology or, or arrhythmias, or, or generally where you can't feel the heart properly. Yeah, and then thinking about things like um, significant myocardial infarction, particularly mm -hmm. when you're looking at inferior MIs um, and whether they are actually causing, causing a bradyarrhythmia. So it's always worth investigating further why somebody's got a slow heart rate. Is that actually because of an MI? Particularly, and, and also on top of that, an exacerbation of heart failure. Is there an underlying MI there as well? So just more and more reasons why those 12 lead ECGs are incredibly important. Uh, and then the last category, um, obstructive, we're, we're more looking at something that's going to mechanically obstruct uh, venous return, particularly. So tension pneumothoraces, for example, where you can actually get compression 
um, vinicabra compression, etc. Um, and things like cardiac tamponade, although hopefully this would be more of an obvious presentation from a traumatic uh, stabbing or something like that. Uh, it's just something to bear in mind and, and would be the reason for the, the shock. So it's important to think in trauma about hypovolemic, but dependent on where the wound is, this could be an obstructive shock as well as a hypovolemic shock. So we want to make sure that we're ruling that out. So key summary points then for the approach to the hypotensive patient. Get an ECG early to determine whether there is a potential cardiac cause to the hypotension and remembering that heart rates above 150 are unlikely to be physiological. Make sure you have good IV access and resuscitate the patient appropriately with fluids or blood products. And remember the four types of shock, distributive or vasodilatory, hypovolemic, cardiogenic and obstructive. So that's a quick run through hypotension and our approach to it and how we think it would be beneficial for you guys to structure your approach in the uh, in simulations and, and in clinical practice moving forward and i hope this is helpful as always we're we're really interested to know what you think about these uh, particularly these newer and um, more compressed versions of the topics 